Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Terry McBenus, the president and CEO of RTCA. Greetings from our nation's capital and welcome to all of you to what is now our 11th in a series of webinars, Aviation Technology Connect. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, created this series via this platform to hear from a variety of aviation industry leaders on a broad spectrum of topics that will educate you, further inspire you in your profession, and perhaps even evolve your thinking as to where the industry is today and where it's going in the future. This uh, webinar series continues to be very successful, exceeding all of our <clears throat> expectations here at RTCA. We've attracted an international audience of upwards of 400 people tuning in each month, not only from here in the United States, but also from Canada, countries across Europe, the Middle East, Africa, South America, Australia, and New Zealand. We've heard from leaders at the FAA, uh, the NTSB, and, and others from our aviation industry. We believe that today's webinar is gonna be equally exciting and informative. Now, um, these previous webinars have all been recorded, as is this one. So if you want to go back and listen to any of our previous webinars, you can find those recordings on the RTC <coughs> channel. Now, we've been holding these webinars on the third Wednesday of each month. And, and like today, each of these webinars is uh, going to focus on a particular topic where you'll gain some insight from industry leaders that I'm confident will be uh, inspirational, strategic, or thought-provoking with the primary goal of them giving you, the audience, the gift of their knowledge. As in previous months, we're gonna hear a short tech talk from one of aviation's industry leaders today, and we'll close out today's session with the presentation of the William E. Jackson Award, which is the annual scholarship award that RT RTCA presents each year to an outstanding graduate student in the field of aviation electronics and telecommunications. Now, I know many of you watching today are, are familiar with us here at RTCA, but I, I do know we have some first-time visitors. So I want to take just a couple of minutes to familiarize you with who we are. RTCA is an aviation-centered standards development organization whose mission is to inspire the creation and the implementation of integrated performance standards that meet the changing global aviation environment and further ensure the safety, security, and overall health of the aviation ecosystem. Now, in addition to developing standards, we also provide training to government and industry personnel on the application of those standards and developing the basis of certification and testing. And on the screen, you can see three of our upcoming training events. At the end of September, we have our Airworthiness Security Certification course, in October, our new course on safety management systems overview for new entrants to the uh, aviation community. And uh, finally, our course on DO 160 uh, version G. You can sign up for any of those courses via our website at, at uh, www.rtca.org. And if you're interested or have any questions about our training, our, our standards development work, and are interested in becoming part of the RTCA family of members so that you too can have a voice in developing those standards, you can contact, again, us directly through our website or via telephone. Now, our uh, ability to bring you these webinars would not be possible without the generous sponsorships from our industry partners. And today, I'm especially thankful to our gold corporate sponsors this year, Collins Aerospace, the National Air Traffic Controllers Association, and the Airline Pilots Association International. In addition, we have the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association as a corporate sponsor this year, and L3 Harris as a webinar sponsor for today's event. Now, we do have some handouts that are gonna be available to you from our sponsors, along with all the speaker biographies. And so to access those handouts, you can download them by clicking on the Documents Handout button that's located on this GoToWebinar platform. When we get to the panel discussion a bit later in the program, again, on this platform, you'll be able to submit questions to the panelists today. And to do so, just click on the comment question mark icon, type in your question, and we'll be sure to get those to the speakers. Now, for those of you that are in the DC area today, we're expected to be impacted by the uh, remnants of Tropical Storm Fred this afternoon. So we're hopeful this webinar is gonna go off without any disruptions or power outages that are gonna be impacting our speakers today. So with that, let's get started. Um, infrastructure, uh, investments and in infrastructure have um, been very much in the news lately. 
uh, just last week, the Senate voted to approve a roughly $1 trillion bill that's now over at the House side of the legislature. But the bill passed last week calls for significant investments in airports to address repair and maintenance backlogs, reduce congestion and emissions near the country's ports and airports, and drive electrification and other low uh, carbon technologies. Now, is any of this needed? Well, of course, the short answer is yes. Uh, there's studies out there that show not a single airport in the United States ranks in the top 25 in the world. But investing in airport infrastructure has to be more than just each airport getting their piece of the pie once those bills are approved and signed into law by the president. Those investments need to be implemented strategically, methodically, and address not only today's needs, but also address the future needs of an ever-changing aviation environment. And this is the topic of today's webinar. So to kick things off with an opening uh, introduction and tech talk, I'm pleased to introduce Ms. Carol Hugo, uh, currently a principal at gate to gate Solutions, and who's also a member of the RTCA's advisory board. Ms. Hugel has spent more than 30 years uh, serving airports, airlines, and air navigation service providers around the globe. She's collabor collaborated with industry stakeholders, designed and implemented safe and advanced solutions that, that balance demand and capacity for the traveling public. And she's had some prior leadership roles in the aviation sector, including manager director of air traffic and surface management strategy at American Airlines, a customer uh, liaison in the uh, FAA's Air Traffic Organization Surface uh, Directorate, Senior Vice President of Advanced Research Engineering Business Development at Metron Aviation, and Director of Air Traffic Systems at Census Corporation. At the conclusion of her Tech Talk introduction, Carol will take over the reins of a panel discussion with our other distinguished guests. So, Carol, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Terry. Um, my name is Carol Hugel, and I have the pleasure of moderating our webinar today. Uh, big thank you to all of you for joining us. We hope that this webinar really is just the first of many forums to engage aviation stakeholders, as well as stakeholders from other transportation sectors, in a really thought-provoking discussion about how best to collaborate and satisfy really long-standing unmet airport infrastructure needs, while at the same time building um, and preparing for our nation's future airport infrastructure needs. And really, as ever, to focus on the needs of the traveling public and to really improve that journey from what they experience today to take advantage of emerging technologies. It is truly an exciting time for the traveling public as technology advances and travel really does become increasingly convenient. There are many new and emerging transportation technologies with business, with business models that promise to present the travelers with on-demand access to safe, modern, and more efficient transportation options that in many cases are much kinder to mother nature. So while it's fair to say that there is a shared commitment to safely improve the journey of travelers and minimize the environmental impact of transportation, we really have not yet reached consensus on the roadmap that's gonna get us there. So we need to enable improvements to today's transportation infrastructure, notably our airports, while at the same time building the infrastructure required to support safe integration of new capabilities both in the air and on the ground. And uh, always, always, always with an eye for safety first. So uh, the RTCA leadership team, notably Terry and his team, really do think that this is the time to start the dialogue. How do we start to build that roadmap? So why now? So as Terry mentioned, and most of you are aware, the Senate has passed a $1 trillion infrastructure package. Um, the House members appear poised to approve that package and send it to the president's desk. So while the ink uh, is not yet dry, uh, the odds are in favor of the passage of a bill. So the infrastructure improvements are, are going to include utilities, electric vehicles and charging stations, improving the power grid and water systems, environmental remediation, and of course, transportation. 
So the funding um, for the transportation sector includes approximately $25 billion in airport infrastructure, of which about $5 billion of that is really slated for FAA investment in facilities. So while $25 billion in funding is certainly welcome to the airport operators, um, it really is effectively a down payment when one considers the infrastructure projects that were already tabled prior to the pandemic in large measure due to funding constraints. Um, and of course, the total financial impact on the airports um, in terms of the pandemic really is yet to be known. So in March of this year, Airports Council International North America published a report and it was titled Building the Runway of Economic excuse me, building the runway to economic growth, investing in airport infrastructure. And the report states there is nearly $115 billion in planned infrastructure projects needed to keep our nation's airports functional and up to date. These projects go beyond new terminals. A significant share of these needs are related to basic maintenance projects needed for safety and reliability. Obviously, there is a significant chasm between $25 billion and $115 billion. Mark, if you could uh, put up slide one, please. Great. This slide is also courtesy of uh, Airports Council International, and it talks about airport priorities for the 2020s and beyond. So the slide identifies a number of challenges really for airports of all sizes across the nation. What really um, jumps out on that slide and is really compelling is the workforce challenge. Um, the, the workforce challenge actually has kind of two different sides to it. So there's always the challenge with uh, key resources with lots of experience who, who leave the organization. The airports are certainly seeing a number of retirements. But then there's the other side of that, which is attracting new talent to airports and uh, really to aviation in general. There are a lot of options, well-funded, future-looking organizations that are really driving the future transportation system. You think about robotics, cybersecurity, energy, sustainability, just to name a few. So a real challenge to attract the talent to sort of backfill on those who have been in an organization for quite some time. So slide two um, is also from uh, ACI North America. And this one talks about the key elements of future airport solutions. Each of those items on the slide, and this is just a, a small sampling of some of the future solutions that are envisioned, each of those individual elements really will require a, a, a cross-functional team of airport stakeholders, often with um, disparate business goals and priorities to come together and really reach consensus on a go forward plan for implementation. And of course, any implementation uh, is going to require ample sustained funding streams, something that's not so easily done um, at the airports in, in the US. So with the expectation that the um, infrastructure bill is in fact going to pass in the not too distant future, and the understanding of the importance of airports to the nation's uh, transportation system. Today, the panel is going to share their views on a variety of matters uh, related to modernization of the um, airport infrastructure. So we're gonna start out with the definition of airport infrastructure. Um, our team actually met in advance of, of the webinar today, and I promise you that you will likely get uh, five different, per, very different perspectives on the definition of airport infrastructure. I said to someone that if we had 10 panelists, we get at least 10 different um, definitions on what that is, which is really important because it underscores the complexity of airport infrastructure and funding that infrastructure. We're also going to talk about perspectives on airport priorities over the next five years, the next 10 years. We're going to talk about how airports are planning for um, these emerging transportation capabilities, specifically around advanced air mobility. Um, we're going to touch on um, aviation and um, the environmental footprint and really what is the airport's role in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We're also going to touch on multimodal. Um, not so long ago, uh, the term curb to curb really referred to the curb outside of the airport. Today, with the um, 
changing perspectives and preferences of the traveler. Curb to curb might be a residence, it might be an office, it might actually be the street curb in the city center. Um, and the uh, first mode of transportation might be a bicycle, it might be an eVTOL, and the final mode of transportation, a wide body jet. So a lot to talk about there in terms of multimodal and where, where the airports actually fit in. And then we're going to um, wrap up the discussion and touching a little bit on interoperability. And then also how do we in the aviation sector start to uh, sort of broaden our reach and engage with those in other transportation sectors as we look at this future transportation ecosystem as just that, an ecosystem whereby the airports are in fact a, a huge, tremendous piece of that, but also recognizing that uh, what the traveling public is asking for is a much more connected ecosystem. So looking at some potential frameworks mechanisms for actually reaching out um, to other transportation sectors. So with that, now I would uh, like to introduce our panelists for the day. Welcome. So I'm going to introduce our panelists and, and share with you their names and their organizations and what they do. And uh, as part of the webinar, you will have access to the bios for each of um, our panelists. So let's start with uh, Justin Barkowski. Justin is Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for the American Association of Airport Executives. Uh, next, we have up um, Chris Collings, and he is responsible for business development at L3 Harris Technologies. Next up, we have, uh, I believe, in alphabetical order, Chris Oswald, Senior Vice President of Safety and Regulatory Affairs for Airports Council International North America. Then we have uh, Greg Pecoraro, who is uh, CEO for Niseo. And then we have Scott Remillard, who is Business Development Manager for ATFM, and uh, he is with Saab. So welcome, gentlemen. Uh, as I said, we're going to kick off with the definition of airport infrastructure. So Chris Collins, do you want to uh, kick us off with your perspective, and then we'll pass it around to the other panelists? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Carol. Um, so, you know, my perspective comes a little bit more from the um, the air side, right, air, the ATC side, and in particularly, you know, uh, data sharing, right? So if, if you look at um, today's infrastructure and, and largely being fixed and, and not being able to build our way out of the problem, like you noted in your chart there, um, you know, we, we should consider the, um, you know, incremental efficiency and environmental impacts of some data sharing project. Um, for example, if you look at what... Um, uh, one of the FAA's next gen projects with the Datacom program, you know, they were able to accomplish uh, since 2016, uh, saving almost 2 million minutes of uh, gate and taxi delay, which resulted in um, 22 million kilograms of CO2 saved. And really what, what that program was all about was taking existing technology uh, on an aircraft and implementing that in a standards based inter interoperable manner. Um, by connecting the a ATC pilots and um, the airline dispatch at the same time to uh, enable those efficiencies. Um, there's a few more programs, I think, that are coming down the, uh, the pipeline in the, um, on the FAA world around um, uh, TFDM and some other information sharing projects. But that takes advantage of the existing physical infrastructure and uh, is able to drive some additional efficiencies and environmental impacts out of the system by um, by simply just making those uh, connections between the uh, the different parties possible, and um, you know I kind of want to leave it with like you know we should we should look for additional opportunities to expand these kind of projects where it's really just taking existing pieces that are there today, linking them together, and um, and and finding a way to to drive some of those additional efficiencies out of the system. Thanks, Chris. Greg, you want to go next? Sure, thanks. So, you know, there are a lot of traditional definitions of what infrastructure at an airport is, and I know we're going to talk about all of those, but I think it's important that as we as we think about this, you know, problem for the for the prospect of you know what we're going to do with some additional funding to support airports, I think it's important that we we think about broadening those uh, those definitions. And 
not just traditional things, but also connections to the airport. Think about the airport as how it's connected to the community. And think about you know, infrastructure for you know, connections to the airport for getting to the airport. Think about uh, connections for powering the airport. And think about uh, connections for communicating with the airport. I think those are you know, some, some new ways of, of, of looking at an airport that we need to incorporate into how we want to plan you know, for, uh, for airports uh, that we can, we can increase their usefulness and build for the future. Thanks, Greg. Scott, you want to go next? Thank you, for, uh, thank you very much. When I think of airport infrastructure, in my mind's eye, I think of looking at the gate of the thing, because that where, is where the epicenter of a series of complex flows occur. You have planes coming in, doing the turn, going out, and those processes are very segmented and complex. At the same time, I got flows of people coming in, either from the road, now trains, and now if we're talking about air mobility from a three-dimensional point to the gate. But the gate is where all of these things are mixed. And if you look at where a lot of airports are growing, they're building you know, new terminals to, to get more gates, and you're starting to now find electronic infrastructure, or IT systems from airports, really taking an airport's role in turning the number of uh, number of turns per day per gate. So that, this, this opens up a whole broadening of thinking of communication and collaboration platforms to break down each of the individual silos of excellence because air traffic, as we know, each segment is simplified to, so we can get our heads around it. But as we start talking about a connected, a connected uh, you know, system, the, the, we have to communicate and collaborate between these things. You know, again, it, jumping ahead, somebody's not going to want to take, you know, pay a premium for a, a electric air taxi to go to an airport to get at the airport to find out that the plane has been delayed for two hours because of an ATC delay. You know, that that, that it, uh, it eliminates the the value proposition of those systems. So this is where we th our thinking is centered. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, how about over to you, uh, Justin? Well, thanks, Carol, and thanks to our RTCA for putting this on and for having us. Uh, excited to be here. I think this is a great uh, place to start the conversation. What is the definition of infrastructure? It's always a fun topic. There's been some cool news stories about how we might be rethinking uh, what this actually means. I think in the airport context, a lot of it is, um, it, the way we think about it is just expensive capital projects. I mean, what are things that we really need to do to improve uh, develop or replace existing facilities. Um, a lot of the traditional things that um, some other folks have already mentioned, like uh, airport terminals, uh, fixing some of the aging infrastructure, parking structures, runway improvements, modernizing ATC facilities. Um, I think when we look at this, uh, the, the scope of the of the problem, and I think the slide you had on earlier, I think really encapsulated a number of different things, but it also gets into um, you know IT infrastructure to improve cybersecurity, uh, touchless technologies. I think Chris and ACI, you guys use the term health infrastructure, which is a nice um, way of putting it. Um, now that COVID has been such a big issue, energy resilience, um, meeting all of our environmental objectives, um, things to help mitigate aircraft noise. Um, I think those are all kind of I don't want to say traditional infrastructure needs, but um, however you want to put them, the the needs are far and wide. And I know we'll talk a little bit more in a moment about priorities, but um, I thought the one thing that was on the slide that was interesting was the workforce development um, and whether or not that's considered infrastructure. And we could debate it all the time. I just know at the end of the day, it is a huge priority, uh, whether you call it infrastructure or not. Um, it is something I think that we need to address. So from an organizational standpoint, I think we see the whole the whole picture that the, the needs are far and wide and whether you call it infrastructure or not, um, uh, we, need, we need money to pay for it. Yeah, thanks, Justin. And not last but least, Chris. No, and, and we, we didn't work this out in advance, but Justin, thanks. You kind of set up where I, where I was gonna be going to is, you know, I, I sort of view infrastructure as some concentric circles when we deal with, with airports. We sort of think of the system that way operationally as well. But for, for airport infrastructure, I mean, that center concentric circle, and it's driven by what funding we've got, uh, you know, access to. Um, you know, in the U.S., that's a lot of, it's a heavily, you know, uh, uh, a system that's 
uh, you know, heavily helped by federal grants, uh, significant contributions on the capital side uh, on that front. Uh, and we, when we look to those types of projects that are you know, eligible for those grants, as well as you know, really required for airports to function, it is the traditional elements Justin's mentioned. And some of those you know, have some maybe you know, newer elements, digital technologies, the, you know, emphasis on IT infrastructure and broader views of energy infrastructure. But you know, all those elements that are necessary to keep the system functioning right now are you know, quite expensive and oversubscribed, as you, as you know from our, our ACI uh, survey when we compare that to uh, you know, available funding. As we start to broaden that definition out to you know, broader you know, concentric circles, just to, you know, for visualization, we've got new generation elements and actually probably an expanding pool of what we define as airport or landing area infrastructure. Where, where will vertiports be fitting in ultimately? Are we looking at those as traditional elements in a, um, uh, in a system? Are they, are they gonna be something entirely outside of the system? Um, you know, where, will, where will those be funded and, and what, what will the kind of supporting infrastructure needs be? As we look to maybe incorporating also, as, as Chris and Scott both referenced, ideas of decision support or efficiency support for infrastructure, where do those elements also fit in? And I think there are you know, probably less traditional funding mechanisms we need to be focused on for how those types of systems start to work and also how they operate in a multi-stakeholder environment, really not things that are owned solely by an airport operator, but elements that are shared among uh, ANSPs, uh, you know, flight operators in the system, uh, service providers uh, or technology providers uh, like, like Saab and, and uh, L3. RSR uh, and and looking you know certainly to the to the airport operators themselves. Uh, I know we've got this. Uh, I, I think this may be coming just a little bit early, but I, I just point out you know on on kind of definitions of infrastructure and those capital needs. Um, you know uh, what we've seen through through the surveys we've conducted. This one just conducted coming through COVID year, um, wrapping up uh, towards uh, towards the middle of this year. Um, you know uh, certainly that kind of infrastructure need. And this is traditional infrastructure, that gap of about $20 billion uh, you know, in, in terms of lost revenue, COVID year. And then the overall capital needs as we look across you know, the next five years, which is general kind of planning, you know, planning timelines for a lot of capital infrastructure in the US, regardless of mode, um, looking at you know, needs of about 115 billion between now and 2025. A lot of that focused on vertical, um, and which includes IT elements, uh, building support services, and supporting infrastructure, whether that's your HVAC system, whether that's your vertical uh, vertical transportation systems, elevators, escalators, uh, and and people mover type type elements within the terminal, um, and then onward to certainly aging airfield infrastructure, uh, terminal access, which is ground transportation, that's roadways, uh, transit ways getting you to the terminals, um, and then you know other elements there, capacity increases, uh, upgrades for uh, um, FA safety standards. Um, and, and other projects as you go through there. So lots and lots of needs, um, lots and lots of needs in that traditional um, you know, inner uh, concentric circle. And then these you know, really unmet, unmet and unaddressed needs as we, as we look forward to things like a, um, um, you know, a space, uh, spaceport access and spaceports uh, you know, to a certain extent, uh, you know, placement in the system um, and other more extensive elements when we deal with power. And I know we'll talk about environmental issues a little bit later as we talk about power supplies and, and what we rely on as airports for, for keeping the system operating and how green those are. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back to you, Carol. Thanks. So Chris, thank you. You just touched on um, with your slide uh, the next five years. Um, do you wanna give us a few comments on priorities uh, uh, for the next 10 years? and then whether or not you see um, investment uh, to ready for these emerging technologies in that 10 year span. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, one, one element that's already been mentioned and I'll, I'll play off of it is, you know, focus on, um, you know, increasing challenges in the US. And I'd say in many of the, the more advanced kind of aviation uh, or countries with advanced aviation systems, uh, evolved uh, airport systems, uh, of building out of the problem that, that just isn't something that's really feasible in a lot of uh, at a lot of u.s airports today um, you can't add runways where land doesn't exist and even in cases where there might be some land available 
um, for large hub airports, you've kind of built out as, or have planned to build out the system about as large as feasible. Um, when I looked at airports like Denver and DFW, you just don't have opportunities to add mm -hmm. brand new runways, you know, further and further away. Um, mm -hmm. Same goes for terminals. In a lot of cases, we've got terminal cores being built out. So the focus on enhancing efficiency and defining enhanced efficiency as part of the infrastructure solutions we're looking at is pretty critical over the next 10 years. And really probably for a number of airports, it's critical right now. Um, so when that comes to elements like um, uh, things that, Carol, you've been involved in, I know Scott and Chris have been involved in, Justin's group you know, has been involved in, um, and not to exclude you, Greg, but I'm, I'm just not sure how, how much you've been involved in, in surface, things like surface uh, collaborative decision-making, you know, broader concepts that get into taking data from the air side, combining it with data we've got on, on the land side or within the terminal to make for more efficient allocation of staff and more efficient use of facilities, um, looking towards better uh, or concepts, uh, you know, US concepts of demand management or you know, uh, you know, the infrastructure supply management, I think also come into play, all, mm -hmm. all in the, you know, towards the goal of making better use of the assets that we've got. Um, and making sure that they're maintained. We've got other elements. We get to facilities and maintenance, uh, you know, issues at airports that deal with asset management, not running, you know, systems to uh, to failure, running them to appropriate maintenance intervals, and that's got a lot to do with smart IT systems, smart airport systems, largely focused on terminals, but also capabilities on the land side. That also wraps into elements that Scott and Chris uh, reflected on in data accessibility. And then, you know, one final bit, and I know we'll talk about this more later, so I don't want to dive into it too far, but, um, you know, in that same kind of efficiency bit, a huge issue for us, not just in the, you know, over the next 10 years, but over the next uh, really 30 to 35 is how we move towards, um, you know, really move the ball towards net zero environments. I know we at ACI have adopted a net zero posture worldwide, um, looking towards 2050. Uh, I know A4A and IATA have adopted similar um, uh, similar focuses. And for us at airports, that really the core of that involves getting to what are called scope scope two and three emissions. We've been done a pretty good job at dealing with our scope one kind of direct uh, emissions that are in our direct control. But we need, really need to start focusing on where are we sourcing our power? How can we encourage investment in cleaner power supply? That's a huge, huge bucket for us on the airport side, just like you know, a huge, huge bucket on getting to net zero for the airlines has been sustainable aviation fuels, which we are also supportive of. So all those elements sort of build into a much broader infrastructure picture. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, anybody else wanna comment on priorities over the next five to 10 years? Carol, I think that it's, um, it's a matter of you, know, how we wanna think about these things. Chris did a great job kind of working through the laundry list there. We know what we need to fix. I mean, there's lots of things out there at the, at the existing airports in the country that will need to be fixed. You know, Chris has made the case and others have, you know, for the tremendous backlog of repairs that need to be done and improvements that need to be done. But we've also got to spend some time thinking about what do we need to do to build the airports in the future? You know, airport infrastructure in this country really hasn't changed much since World War II. And, and there's a lot of things that are emerging in aeronautical technology. So we've got to think about that, not just aeronautical technology, but other technology. And you know, how do we want airports in the future to look to accommodate you know, what passengers expect, what communities expect, you know, what the government wants to make happen in terms of you know, some of the national priorities. How do we use some of this $25 billion and hopefully much more money that will come in the future you know, to be able to, uh, to start at least planning for and starting to, uh, to build some of those kind of things. You know, Airports that are greener and more quiet, as Chris mentioned, airports that accommodate these emerging technologies, airports that are easier to get to, airports that um, are easier to pass through to or from a flight, you know, airports that are better connected to their communities. You know. And what do we do about this tremendous network of general aviation airports that we have across the country? We have thousands of GA airports across the country. Some are in the suburbs of, of major cities, but a lot of them are connected to, to smaller cities and towns all across the country. These are great access points with these new emerging technologies. These are great ways for people to get into the aviation system to a larger, more expanded aviation system that these new technologies are making possible. So, so we've got to sort of think about these things a little bit differently and, and imagine how and reimagine you know, how these airports fit into the national aviation system 
and, and how we want to spend some of this money to make that possible. Thanks, Greg. Anybody else want to comment on priorities before we uh, move along? I'll just do one quick um, note here and just to put a fine point on it. I think some of the needs that we continuously hear about are, are really about accommodating the increased demand for air travel. I know we've seen the reduction obviously because of COVID, but it has bounced back pretty quickly. Obviously the Delta variant slowing things right now, but it, it's gonna come back. It's gonna go back to normal levels before we know it. So what can we do? And I think that's the main priority. I think from the chart that you know Chris put up, I think that's the main priority. I just want us to uh, put a fine point on that because whether it's increasing um, uh, modernizing terminals to increase uh, international traffic, expanding the number of gates, new runways or extending runways. Um, we also have to think about how COVID has shifted where people are living too. Certain areas have seen pretty substantial growth and are now busting at the seams in some of their terminals. So um, we kind of have a shifting world now because of COVID and a lot of it is just new air travel in different parts of the country and we need the facilities to support that. So that's just one thing I'd, I'd put a fine point on as we uh, as we move on to the next topic. Sure, thanks Justin. So um, part of the, the bill obviously has a, a real focus on the environment, environmental remediation, and all of us are aware that uh, aviation is not uh, um, high on, on the, I should say in aviation, the environmental challenge is high on the list to address, but it's taking us a long, long time to do that. So um, let's chat a little bit about um, what you view as the airport's role in particular in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's a, it's a very complex subject, um, in some cases a lightning rod for discussion, but with all of your expertise, uh, certainly something that you all are, are able to provide a, a seasoned um, perspective on. So um, um, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, who would like to kick us off? I'll go first. I think I think it's 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 pretty simple. I think it's fostering, really providing leadership in the electrification of aviation. And you're seeing, and I've talked to a, a number of airports, and they see themselves, you know, as you know, airports aren't businesses; they are stewards of community assets, and as such, they have a little more freedom to be more proactive in the spirit of the community versus a cold, hardline P and L. Uh, so you're finding leadership in electrification, you know. Uh, electric uh, you know carts of all manner and again infrastructure now power stations sustainability do I move if I'm at an airport near an ocean do I got to move the substation because the water is going to increase over years and that's that's you know providing electrification and I think number two is just better utilization of the current assets they have um, as you know as we all know airports are sometimes real busy sometimes airports are really not busy and I, I clearly we are not getting the most efficient use out of these fixed assets as we possibly can due to i think the silos of how fundamentally aviation different stakeholders are doing different things which may have complementary or conflicting uh, goals so those are the two things better utilization okay. and electrification thanks scott anybody else no carol airports um you know are, are just part of this this solution here airlines are also doing a lot you know uh, and you know some airlines have announced a lot of plans to uh, develop you know, greener aircraft. They're working on new technologies. You know, uh, there's a there's a huge federal investment as well as a private investment in, in cleaner fuels, biofuels, and things like that. That's going to be an important part of the solution, so that you know, you know, aircraft aircraft while in the air, as well as while you're sitting on the uh, on the tarmac, you are, are doing less to contribute to these problems. But airports can do a lot more too. Airports. Yeah, you know, like Pittsburgh International Airport, which uh, they took themselves off the local grid. They're using you know, natural gas, which of course the Pittsburgh area is rich in, in, in those kinds of resources, so they were able to do that. You know, that in combination with solar energy uh, resources, you know, they've taken themselves off the grid. They've protected themselves from any kind of power outages in the area, and uh, and they're you know, they're doing more to make themselves you know, cleaner and, and, and quieter in, in that regard. So. There's lots of local airports can do, you know, if the airports have the resources, and that's also got to be part of what we're looking at you know, as we uh, as we work on this issue. You know, when we talk about the $25 billion that is going to airports, I think it's important to think about all the other money 
from the bill that is going to other things that could benefit airports, right? I mean, there's, there's a tremendous opportunity for airports to be much better connected you know, to the national power grid, you know, to cleaner sources of energy. So that's something that we've got to be thinking about as well. And there's lots of other you know, things that you know, we talk about in other areas, but, but that's, that's just one place that we need to be thinking about. Think about airports not as, as isolated places, but, but as part of a national infrastructure. And how does the entire national infrastructure that we're going to try to improve, you know, improve airports as well? Thanks, Greg. Anybody else? Chris, Oswald, were you going to say yeah, something? I was going to just throw in real quickly and, and maybe point folks to uh, to my colleagues up at uh, ACI World in Montreal. We've had a ongoing you know, multiple regions uh, across ACI um, you know, for now. It's uh, I think closing in on six years. I've had a airport carbon accreditation program really focused at incentivizing and recognizing those airports that are moving ahead with reducing, you know, initially planning to reduce their emissions and then, then uh, engaging in activities to take care of scope one, direct emissions that, that are within the airport's control and moving them through scope scope two and scope, scope three, I guess you can also say scope three plus uh, emissions with the goal of, of, you know, getting to net zero emissions uh, over the, you know, over the longer term. Um, we've seen, you know, a great deal of, of interest and uptake in that program. It's cooled a bit through COVID uh, era because of losses in revenue and redirection of resources. Um, but you know, certainly seeing that as a as a incredibly important set of set of goals and activities uh, for the upcoming ten years. And I just point again, I've already made that point, but uh, or the point that, as Greg does that it's it's broader than. Kind of the local uh, concerns at an airport alone it's really a much bigger there needs to be a much bigger national strategy and i'll use that down payment language also to talk about energy infrastructure i think looking at this infrastructure bill is really that initial down payment on conversion or you know kind of making making greater strides towards decarbonizing the energy grid which is very very critical to airports hitting their goals uh, airlines and, and flight operators are a little bit different story different sources of carbon on that front Okay, great, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so um, how about if we uh, move on to the subject of, of multimodal and uh, where does the airport fit in, uh, in that scenario? Um, anybody wanna go first, kick it off? Yeah, sure, Carol. You know, airports are, are part of a, a national transportation system. And this is where our organization would People I represent, the um, state aviation agencies, you know, they can play a critical role as they develop statewide aviation plans. They need to be talking to their colleagues in the rest of the state's DOT to make sure that the state aviation plan is fitting in with the state's overall transportation plan and making sure that, that the transportation network in the state is, is really coordinated to make sure that people are able to move you know, to and from the airport, that cargo, that people, that everything that's you know, interacting with needs to be able to move easily through that, uh, through that system. And that's, again, a place where you know, the, the infrastructure bill, it covers a lot more than airports. There's an emphasis in the, in the bill on um, intermodalism. And I think that we need to think about airports more carefully as part of that intermodal system. And there's a tremendous opportunity to make sure that you know, we are doing a better job of connecting airports, not just via, via rail and via um, you know, highways, but also as we think about some of these new emerging technologies, you know, EV tall aircraft, and using you know, suburban or rural airports as access points you know, to, a, um, you know, to a, a, a larger commercial airport, making sure that you know, people, you know, people have multiple ways to access the airport. That's an important part of how we think about these things as well. So I think there's lots of opportunities you know, to, uh, you know, to think differently about, what, about the airport's role in the multimodal transportation system. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Multimodal? Okay. I think I sound like a, oh, a ahead, broken Scott. record again. And I think all of these things are fundamentally being enabled by a collaboration platform that, that, that puts it together. When you start talking about, you know, the notion of, of people flying in, what you're doing, what your nest is doing is just providing another pathway for humans to get to a gate of an air, air an airport, and, mm -hmm. and and fundamentally, there's there's just gross inefficiencies right at that point. Um, that I think where I would advocate that the that this infrastructure bill be a down payment on trying to solve 
some of those basic congestion issues today that solve problems today, but have to be solved if we plan to be efficient in a more multimodal and more ways to access airports. Mm -hmm. So um, as we're always uh, looking to continuously improve, um, a, a sort of a common thread amongst all of the, the dialogue, regardless of the particular topic, is that this kind of a, a thought of being siloed. And in some of our earlier discussions, uh, one of you used the term insular, that aviation seems to be quite insular. Well, this infrastructure bill um, really is um, demanding that we look at things a little bit differently. And that is that we are one part in aviation, one part of a very large transportation ecosystem. So I'd be interested in, in you all sharing your perspectives on how do we do things a little bit differently in aviation so that we are in fact able to more expeditiously, always under the umbrella of safety of course, but more expeditiously adapt um, to the needs of those that we're here to serve. So we're, we're here to serve the traveling public. And certainly technology is evolving at a much, much faster pace than, than we could have anticipated even 10 years ago. So it feels like we need to do things a little bit differently in aviation in order to uh, make ourselves, um, I would just say, a more integral part of, of this dialogue as we move forward. Um, there's been a lot of talk about you know, bridges, roads, rails, and seemingly not so much discussion about the, the airport's infrastructure side of the bill, and certainly it didn't get the lion's share of the uh, funding. Um, so I, I'd like to talk a little bit about how do we do things differently? Are there mechanisms that we haven't capitalized on to, to broaden the engagement with stakeholders and other sectors? As somebody said it earlier, this whole multimodal is, is and, and AAM is not just um, about what happens in the air. It's also about what happens on the ground. So um, uh, I think it'd be really um, prudent to share some thoughts on how do we do things a little bit differently, engage with other sectors, but also attract um, new talent to, to a sector that we all find really energizing, but uh, to date, it, it's been a little bit difficult to attract new talent. <laughs> Anybody want to take that on first? Well, Carol, I, I got a couple of comments on that, right? I mean, right. It, I think it's a balance, right? In, in aviation, mm -hmm. we certainly have to balance the, um, the speed of today's in it technological innovation with the speed of safety, right? Mm -hmm. We certainly don't want to have uh, to, to miss a step and um, and and have a, you know an unfortunate incident or something. So I, I think we've got to take those things and and look for opportunities where uh, the aviation community can innovate quickly and and get those sort of benefits, but also balance that with the fact that um, you know we do need to keep uh, safety as the number one um, objective. Okay, thanks, Chris. Scott, you look like you were going to say something. You're on mute. It's, yeah, you know, one of the things that why there isn't a lot of money in aviation is that because the safety record is tremendous. You know, if there were on, if there were on a number of unfortunate safety incidents, there would be more money, more of a cry for investment. It's a kind of a sad uh, commentary in our industry because we're doing so well that wow, there's no problem here and money's directed otherwise. But uh, that was my comment. That's a really interesting perspective. Thank you. Anybody else? Now, Carol, as, as somebody who, who once worked for a multimodal state transportation agency, I don't want to denigrate any of the other modes, but you know, aviation is, is a lot of fun. You know, it's an exciting field to be in, and you know, a lot of new, uh, new ideas and technologies that were emerging. And I think, you know, for one thing, you know, touching on the workforce issue that you mentioned at the end of your, your question, we've got to do a better job of communicating that excitement you know, to a larger group of people who, who do need to attract a lot more talent. There's a tremendous amount of money being invested in these new technologies right now. And so going along with that, there's tremendous opportunity for young people, great young people who want to get involved and are looking for a great career you know, to, uh, to get involved in, in, in aviation right now. So I'm really hopeful that, uh, that we'll see you know, a, lot more, a lot more people, a more diverse group of people you know, getting involved in, in aviation over the next few years because there's so much opportunity. But Craig. You know, beyond yep. that, I think that um, you know we've um, you know we we again we've got to think about some of these things a little bit differently. You know, aviation plays such a tremendous role 
in, in making possible so much of what we enjoy about modern life. I mean, getting that package to grandma tomorrow that you know, we forgot to send for her birthday present, that's only possible because of aviation. You know, over the last 18 months, as we've all lived through the pandemic, how many of us have, have asked for things to be sent to us and we wanted them the next day and they got there? You know, very often the next day. And that's made possible by this aviation system that, uh, that's been built. It's, it's the best in the world. It's underfunded to be sure. You know, the infrastructure needs to be improved and repaired and, and reimagined in some ways, but it works great right now. And you know, it's, um, you know, I think that, you know, as, as, you know, as you said, you know, maybe that's part of the problem. It, it works too well. People take it for granted. And I think that we need to give a little more care and attention to it because you know, it really is a tremendous economic engine for this country. You know, America has been a world leader in aviation technology, and it's been something that we've exported all around the world. And if we want to keep doing that, then we've got to pay more attention to these issues and make sure that, that we remain, you know, that our infrastructure you know, becomes world class again. We've fallen behind so many other countries. You know, the infrastructure has got to be world class in order to make the industry work. Um, and Justin, I'll get right to you here. Just a quick comment on, on Greg's remarks. It, it feels like there are uh, lessons to be learned from other parts of the world. So our safety record, of course, is, is unsurpassed. Um, but, but I would suggest that the passengers, uh, the commuters, um, might disagree with how well it functions. Um, you know, every other day there's something on the, uh, on the old tube here about um, you know, an airline that is not meeting the needs of the traveling public. So I think we need to be mindful that the, the composition of the traveling public is more diverse than it was before and the needs are very different. So my question was really around how do we maintain that amazing safety record, um, but also do things a little bit differently, learn from other parts of the world, for example, but also learn from the from the traveling public and, and listen, I guess, listening and learning to what it is they're asking for. Um, and it just feels like maybe we could do a little bit more collaboration in a, in a different way to, to meet those really, really evolving, changing needs that the, that the travelers are expressing. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Justin, over to you. Yeah, just, just a few comments on the, the multimodal topic. And I know you pivoted a little bit there from where I was going, uh, but I think, how do we get the conversation started? I, I think a lot of this starts at the local and regional level. Um, what makes sense for those particular communities as opposed to um, us from a national perspective trying to impose or prioritize multimodal um, projects on our communities? I think a lot of this emanates from you know, what makes sense for a particular city, a particular region. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say from AAAE's perspective, we don't get a ton of questions about multimodal. I don't know if it because we are so insular, if airport planners are simply looking at the airport themselves instead of the broader uh, city or regional plan that's in place. But um, we simply don't get asked quite a bit about it. And Frank, we hear a lot about the rideshare service demand um, that we still are dealing with where to put these Ubers and Lyfts that are showing up at our terminals. Um, there's constant changes that go on with that. So um, I, I think those conversations do have to start locally and regionally, because um, unfortunately, we I'm hoping more people to hear this and say, oh, Justin, we should have this conversation then. But unfortunately, we don't get asked about this quite a bit from our members at all. OK, thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll echo that uh, from, from our side. And I think you know, uh, going back to my past before I was on the association side as a planner, um, and sorry, sorry, Greg, on this front, I, I think there's, there's always been a huge challenge in doing um, regional planning, regional transportation planning efforts, let alone state transportation planning efforts that really cross modal lines effectively. And it's, it's in, in a lot of ways, the way that various modal components of the, the US transportation system are organized. We have locally run, locally operated airports by and large, um, you know, with some exceptions, you know, states of Hawaii and Alaska as, as key ones there. But um, you've got really much broader state control over highway systems, local or regional control over transit systems. And those variations in governance structures, those and certainly the the siloing of funding mechanisms by mode, uh, you know, creates 
you know, has created this, you know, I think a lot of the barriers that Justin, you, you, you know, kind of allude to. And it just means that, you know, at airports, I think there, there isn't a lot of value maybe placed in those broader regional plans because the levels of control, the levels of realization are mm -hmm. really, really challenging, you know, in, in many, yeah. many areas. So, um, and I don't, I, I'm not going to say I see a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, bright lights on the horizon that'll say that that's going to, that's going to be a fundamentally changing situation. So I tend to look at, you know, kind of say on modal access to airports, what are we likely to be seeing? And, and there it's going to be, how do we accommodate the upcoming wave of uh, electrified vehicles? Um, certainly airports have moved to provide select spaces, but you're going to see a broad uptake of those vehicles. And how do you provide charging? How do you see revenue producing opportunities with that charging capability? You start to work with partnerships with those that might be able to provide that. Um, lots and lots of interesting you know, elements. And all of that is really outside the federal sphere because in all likelihood, it's going to be um, revenue generating capability. And that's not something that the federal government funds at our airports. It's an opportunity for airports really on that front. Um, you know, how do you make effective use of you know, on-demand automated transportation systems and accommodate those in the coming you know, 15, 20 years? Um, you know, maybe sooner. Um, those are elements, people like the private cars investing in transit systems, although I love it and I used it to get to my office today. That's just not the way that in most cases you're gonna see airports operating. So, you know, I, I'd just be, you know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, council realism and, and look at where we actually see demand you know, coming into airports and, and what systems mm -hmm. we use going forward. And maybe strengthening you know, your regional and state planning um, capabilities and figuring out ways we can cross uh, some of those barriers, some of those organizational barriers better. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, Carol, you got, um, you've got a couple of questions that have come in. Is this a good Great. spot for you? It is. Okay. Um, the first question that, that we got um, involved the different kinds of investments that can be made. Um, how, uh, how prepared is the industry to offer uh, OPEX, operating expenditures, uh, rather than CapEx or capital expenditures uh, as those types of solutions, those OPEX solutions to help both the airports and the airlines become more profitable? That's a great question. Um, Justin and, and Chris, you come to mind as uh, folks to provide some perspective on that? Yeah, I can maybe throw in to start with and, and trying to interpret how that, that question goes because I, I think um, my mind goes to um, you know solutions that have moved into the marketplace more so in other countries than the U.S., um, where instead of uh, you know providing infrastructure through a capital expenditure uh, that that the airport you know the airport owner would engage you know would go ahead and spend, you'd move that over to some type of service contract, um, and you'd provide. Actually, there's a there's an example maybe I could point to in L.A. with their their uh, um, uh, people mover air train system that will be serving the rental car garage, um, as well as remote parking facilities and rental, you know, rental car folks. And you know, that's being provided as a service contract, long, you know, also kind of, you call it a P3 of, of sorts, um, build, operate, transfer, you know, of, approach, um, where, you know, they're looking for uh, really, you know, kind of availability payments, service payments over, over the life of the facility. Other cases where that's used, special systems in airports, HVAC systems, for instance, or building control systems where uh, the vendor would come in, um, offer upgrades to those systems, you know, in exchange for, multi, you know, a, a multi-year contract to run those systems and you're kind of paying for it through the service contract. Those are really challenging within the U.S. in the way that our U.S. funding system works because FAA grant funding is not set up to deal with operating expenses. Um, the CARES and CRISA and Rescue Act, you know, provisions which enabled us to take those funds on an emergency basis aside. It, those, those funding mechanisms just aren't there, um, and I don't see them really being offered by 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 Congress. We might be looking at, you know, pushing for that uh, going forward, but it's just not something that's that's easily accessed within the way that the U.S. airport publicly run airports, largely on the commercial service side, lots of the GA side as well, um, and on the federal grant side you know, looking for capital projects that fit in that CapEx bucket as opposed to OpEx. And I'll turn that to Justin. He's got additional bits. Yeah, Justin? 
No, I don't have too much to add to that. I would just echo Chris's comments just about the the regular regulatory structure and how much um, restrictions airports have on what they can do with funding, how they can raise funding. Um, the, the structure that we have makes that very difficult to um, facilitate and don't want to get too much into the weeds on all, on all of those things. That's probably a separate conversation. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Any more, Terry? Uh, yeah. Um, so how do, or maybe a better way to say is, how should the airlines have any influence over uh, the investment priorities in airports? <laughs> oh, do they? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I don't know. You know maybe we could, uh, you know, add an airline person here to 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 uh, compare and contrast. Um, but you know, in the in the U.S. context, a lot. Um, you know, very, it depends a lot on what your uh, you know what your use and lease agreements are, and kind of airport setup is uh, with rates and charges uh, back to the airlines. But in a lot of cases, airports have a majority and in interest uh, uh, requirements. Certainly, if you're looking to impose a PFC, you got to bring in all your Passenger facility charge. You got to bring in all your uh, 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 flight operators, uh, signatories, uh, into um, you know agree to the to the projects that you're proposing that would drive the imposition, as well as then again when you do the consultations when you uh, go to spend that. So, um, and I think airports that have been successful um, with their capital programs, you know, have recognized the you know that that doesn't need to be an adversarial interaction. Um, it needs to be a collaborative interaction. And we go to that, I mean, it's simple to say, hard to deliver on, but you know, airports that have involved their carriers meaningfully, uh, both in the preparation of capital plans, uh, development of the five-year CIP, development of master plans at airports, as well as in subsequent phases of design, refinement, cost estimation, value engineering, are those that you know, see swifter implementation generally. I mean, uh, just anecdotally, I'd say that's, that's been pretty consistent. Um, and, you know, that, that expands too as you start to look at P3 developments like, you know, the, the uh, central terminal building at LaGuardia, um, you know, individual terminal facility, uh, P3 development at Kansas City and terminal development there. Um, it's really only through that kind of collaborative effort that you, that you can succeed and not end up at the end of a capital project with, you know, terrible relationships and, you know, challenging getting into that OPEX environment challenging environments as you proceed to operate. So uh, anyway, maybe partial answer. I'll again turn to Justin on the you know, other side. You know, with, with no, I, I think you hit on it. it. It should be a collaborative process. Obviously, the airlines are the customer. They're the operators at the airport. Their feedback, their input, their goals, their object, all of that is, is necessary. We need to have that voice in the room. Uh, but at the end of the day, sometimes those uh, objectives differ with what the airport and ultimately the community that's being served has in mind. And so ultimately, obviously, we're biased. Uh, we, we favor the airports and, you know, airports have their preferences and they're the ultimately the ones serving their community and responsible for the community. So uh, but those conversations uh, need to be had. And, and obviously, airline input is is very valuable and is needed. Um, this question is, kind of, is really my question. Um, one of the things I've noticed is since I've been at RTCA, and one of, one of the challenges I think we have in aviation is that we, we tend to design, build, and, and certify systems that are intended to last for 30, 40, 50 years, um, yet technology is moving much more faster than that. And so maybe this is a good question for uh, Chris Cummings and Scott. Um, you know, how do you plan for infrastructure investments that are designed to last for a long time, yet you're dealing with technologies that are moving much faster? Uh, Terry, it's a great question, and I think it's a challenge, right? I mean, even for, uh, I would say, projects that are relatively static, you come up and find problems and challenges along the way that need to get fixed. And you know, a lot of times, especially when you're looking at investment that requires uh, an up upgrade to an aircraft to uh, realize those savings, um, it could be a very long time before the uh, aircraft operator it is plans to make another investment in that in, in that technology to do the upgrade. And so it does become very challenging because you're sort of uh, almost pigeonholed into the technology that exists today 
and try to take that as far as you can into the future. And so uh, it does become very challenging. You know, I, I think it does relate back a little bit to the other question around, you know, the, the CapEx versus OpEx equation, right? And, and, you know, sometimes viewing these technology projects is not a one and done, but rather a, you know, sort of a, a, a continuum spread over a period of time where you're going to have to make an investment in ground infrastructure, air infrastructure, and, 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 and your stakeholders making an investment in infrastructure as well in a lot of cases to make, um, especially thinking about, you know, IT projects and such uh, to be able to make the, um, the savings a reality. But it's a, it's a tough, it's a, it's a tough thing that doesn't really have a good answer to it today in the, in the way things uh, work both tech, technologically, uh, certification wise, when you're talking about an aircraft and um, uh, certainly the way that the business models are, um, are set up for, um, for this, for a lot of the stakeholders here. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. It's a tough, tough question and really no good answers. But I think there also needs to be a realization, you know, that the fundamental business models of airports are changing, right? I, I would be hard pressed for an airport to say, I'm going to make, it's a good investment to be build more parking garages, right? Because we know that Ubers and people are going to not park, you know, their personal cars. The business model of somebody going to a bookstore to buy a book before they're getting on the plane or getting to the airport three hours early and having a, a nice dinner, I think are going to be less and less because there's going to be a move to get people in and, and through the airport faster. Uh, the best answer that we can come with, again, is, is kind of what we talked before. Is I think electricity and elect electrical infrastructure are going to be key to all of what we're going to be doing. So, I mean, I think that's that's an easy, a fairly easy one. You know, and, and, and IT and technology, you know, dark fiber that facilitate, and, and what I said in the beginning, is systems that facilitate collaboration and communication among different stakeholders to break down the silos, to be, get more efficient of what we already have. That is new technologies, new concept of operations come in that can plug into that framework. So I, I maintain that, that that framework, that collaboration communication platform, I think is an essential foundational element that uh, is worthy of infrastructure consideration as part of this bill. Terry, just to um, tag on to, to Chris and Scott's remarks, um, when you ask the question, what comes to mind for me is what is the definition of airport infrastructure? I think what we're seeing is this is a really complex question. What is it? And then uh, I also, what rings in, in my brain is it's the way we've always done it. And it seems, it feels like this infrastructure bill and how we're going to dole out this, this funding really prompts um, consideration for, is the way we've always done it, the way we should continue to do it. So you know, for me, it is, we need to really reach consensus on what we're talking about with airport infrastructure and our approach to funding it. Um, as, as Justin alluded to, we're not gonna talk about, about funding. There are a lot of perspectives on how to perhaps do that a little bit differently. But I think we really need to, um, I'll just circle back to the remarks I made earlier. We really need to think about is the way we've always done it, the way we should be doing it going forward. Safety first, uh, Scott and others have touched on collaboration essential, but it feels like maybe the framework and the mechanism that we've used um, warrant um, some reconsideration. Great. Well, we're about out of time. I don't know, Carol, if you have any concluding comments overall. Um, I would just like to uh, thank the panelists and, and echo Justin's earlier comment. Thank you to Terry for um, providing the platform for, for folks to get the dialogue started. Um, as I said in my opening remarks, we hope this is the first of, of many more webinars on this topic or other forums on the topic. Really complex, really energizing. Um, so big thank you to all of our, our panelists. Over to you, Terry. Thank you, thank you Carol. Um, thanks, Carol. Uh, thanks, Chris Collings, Justin, Chris Oswald, Scott, Greg. Um, what a great discussion. And as Carol said, I think we certainly have the opportunity to um, do some further discussions on this topic. And again, we will pick up a, another segment of this in our webinar next month, but I think it'll, we'll be doing some things beyond that because this is a very important topic and it's so critical to the future of our, our transportation system. So again, thank you to all of you. Uh, last week, I had the distinct honor to present this year's William E. Jackson Award 
Uh, we were able to record that presentation. So without further ado, let's run the tape of that presentation. Each year, RTCA presents a scholarship award to an outstanding graduate student in the field of aviation electronics and communications. This scholarship, which we first awarded back in 1975, is named in honor of William E. Jackson, who was a true pioneer in the development and the implementation of this nation's air traffic control system and was an enthusiastic supporter of student engineers. His deep interest in engineering students was an inspiration for many in choosing a career in aviation. And as an interesting side note about Mr. Jackson, in the mid-1920s, while working at General Electric, he was a central part of a worldwide group of thousands of experimenting wireless engineers referred to as hams. And they used ham radios and, and Morse code to communicate among themselves between 42 different countries, all in an effort to improve code transmission when two-way communications was the first wireless technology. Now in the past several years, um, commercial space launches have become more prevalent and as we witnessed last month with the uh, successful launches of uh, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, they become high profile media events as well. And one of the challenges to other users, users of the airspace is that during these launches and the subsequent recovery, the FAA prohibits large areas of airspace that remains prohibited for hours at a time, resulting in the rerouting of hundreds of airline flights. And the costs associated with these, this rerouting to the airlines and other operators um, is borne upon the airlines, not the operators of the uh, commercial enterprises making the launch. And this is a problem that's not getting any easier to solve. Uh, the growth in the number of commercial space launches has been incredible. Uh, according to the FAA's website, 26 commercial launches occurred in 2019, 39 launches in 2020, and this year in 2021, there are 52 scheduled launches planned of which 36 of them have already been completed. So that's one per week in 2021. Plus there's now 12 FAA licensed spaceports across the United States. So with that background, uh, this year I'm excited to present the 2021 William E. Jackson Award to Dr. Rachel E. Tomka. Dr. Tompa's submission to the award selection committee was a dissertation that she wrote while working on her Doctor of Philosophy degree at Stanford University's Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And it was entitled, Optimal Aircraft Rerouting During Space Launches. Certainly a, a very timely topic. Dr. Tompa has developed a keen interest in the development of advanced algorithms for robust decision-making systems, particularly in the area of air and space traffic management. Now, prior to enrolling at Stanford, she received a bachelor's degree from Northeastern University in mechanical engineering and physics. And uh, she participates in several uh, educational outreach programs to encourage interest in science, technology, engineering, math, and aviation. And she's also a private pilot. So congratulations, Rachel. Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, I'm really honored to receive this award and I'm really excited about the best improvements we have in aviation and how we can integrate commercial space launches better inside of our national airspace system. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great. And, um, Great. and we um, have a, a stipend that will be a recipient of this year's award. So uh, we'll get that award, so in the mail to you uh, uh, once we're finished here. And uh, appreciate the, all the great work that you've done on this, this important timely topic. So thank you very much. And that concludes uh, the presentation of this year's 2021 William E. Jackson uh, Award. Thank you for listening. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, I tell you, just a remarkable young woman that, that has a great future in front of her. So uh, um, again, congratulations to Dr. Tomka. Uh, great, great work. Well, this concludes uh, our webinar for today. Again, my sincere appreciation to Ms. Carol Hugo from Gate to Gate Solutions. Mr. Chris Oswell from ACI North America, Mr. Justin Barkowski from AAAE, Mr. Uh, Chris Collins from L3 Harris, Mr. Scott Remillard from Saab, and Mr. Greg Pecoraro from Maseo. Thank you all for your valuable participation this afternoon. And again, I wanna say thank you to our sponsors for today's um, webinar. Um, they are Collins Aerospace, the National Air Traffic Controllers Association, 
the Airline Pilots Association International, and the Aircraft Owners and uh, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association and L3 Harris. Uh, even during these difficult times, these organizations have stepped up to help uh, bring this webinar series to you. For the audience, thank you for joining us today. I hope you found today's presentations educational, inspiring, and, and evolving. And again, these webinars are being recorded. So if you want to review anything presented today or any of our past webinars, you can do so by going to the RTCA YouTube channel. Again, next month, we're going to take up this topic of airport infrastructure again with part two of this segment on airports. Uh, we'll be hearing from some executive leaders from several airports around the country. So it promises to be uh, just as timely of a discussion, as well as getting some great insights from our country's uh, airport operators. So our next monthly webinar is going to be held on Wednesday, September 29th, again at one o'clock Eastern time. Thank you again for being with us and have a great day.